Max is ready, right, Max? Um, <laughs> we're situating ourselves still. Uh, today we're going to have Maximilian uh, Werner, who I will continue to call Max from now on, uh, and just, you know, too many, too many syllables and too little time. Um, so Max Werner and Ken Critchfield are, are reading and performing tonight, um, and I think it's going to be really exciting. I heard Max read the other day at Royal Hall St. Mark's, and uh, just fantastic stuff. Beautiful uh, lyric uh, writing. Uh, he read from his memoir that was, I just think, poignant and beautiful. Uh, Max lives in Salt Lake City and uh, teaches writing at the University of Utah, as well as Westminster, I think, right now. Uh, his poems, fiction, creative, nonfiction, essays, and interviews have appeared in several journals magazines, including uh, Matter Journal, Edward Abbey Edition, The North American Review, Yale Anglers Journal, Got a good copy of that. That's very cool. Um, uh, Isle, uh, Weaver Studies, Fly Rod and Reel, Puerto del Sol, and Columbia. Uh, he's an uh, Academy of American uh, Poets Prize winner, and his book Black River Dreams uh, won the 2008 Utah Arts Council Original Writing Competition for Nonfiction. Uh, and the book was published in January uh, by Barclay uh, Creek Press. Please welcome Max Werner. Thanks a lot, Joel, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Now, incidentally, uh, Natasha, I believe you won the uh, 2008 Award for Poetry the same year, didn't you? I think you did, yeah. So maybe you forgot, but I, I recall seeing your, your name, but in any case. Um, I want to begin by, first of all, thanking uh, Natasha Saye uh, of Westminster for uh, initiating this event, and then for, uh, to Joel Long for uh, seeing it through. So thanks a lot for having me out. I appreciate it. Um, it's nice to be here. I actually attended the uh, City Art reading functions many, many years ago, back in the late 90s, when they were held over in the Methodist, I think it was a Methodist church, a little round structure, so it was, oh, Lutheran church, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, at, at that time, uh, as I recall, we had, uh, City Art had people like, I think Mark Strand, Mark Strand was here in town, and Larry Levis, and I don't know, do you remember that, Joel? I do, I saw, I saw. He must have been about five years old at that time. <laughs> But in any case, it's nice to be to be back here in, in, uh, in this way. So, thank you. Uh, tonight, I wanted to uh, I want to read uh, the first essay of my book. It's titled "Second Water," and uh, it uh, recounts the my my first experience fly fishing when uh, a, a neighbor of mine had given me a a regular spin pole, but it had a fly on it. And so, in any case, uh, it's titled "Second Water," and I dedicate it to my mother and first water, Nancy. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I thought that when I left a place, the roots I had put down were cut. I now know some roots cannot ever be fully severed, and that wherever I have lived, I am still in some way there. At the moment, my roots are spread throughout the mountains and deserts of the West, but in the right light, I could see the faint offshoots stretching east to Caribou, Maine, and to my childhood where they undulate along the banks of the Caribou Stream. I haven't set foot in Caribou since my family left in 1979, not physically anyway. I lie here in the high desert and wonder how the life I had then might have shaped the life I have now. However much it may, may seem otherwise, time is layered. It collapses, advances, and recedes. Among the layers, woven in the loam, are my dreams about Caribou. Perhaps they are trying to tell me something. But when I look inside those oblique proxies, I do not find life, but rather the damp, winding tunnels where life had once been. Surely the past is a dissolving map, but I can still remember the day I caught and killed my first trout. First are like other memories, except their cores resist the fire of time and the aging brain. This explains why I can still see my neighbor, Judy, a full-blooded Mi'kmaq Indian with a smooth brown face, full cheeks, and simple haircut. Judy was poor as dust, and though she had nothing, she would have given to me if I had needed it. I recall her averted eyes as she gave me her father's old fishing rod. The rod, a six-footer with a spinning reel, was a going-away gift and maybe a little more. <clears throat> Within the week, my brother and I would say goodbye to Maine and to our father, and then fly to Utah to join my mother and sister. Those days were some of the hardest I had lived. But Judy and angling for trout softened the strangeness of those hours. I had never owned a fishing rod, so I could hardly resist going the moment Judy put the rod in my hand. 
I didn't, though, because I was well-mannered, and it was near dark. I asked Judy if her father didn't need the rod anymore, and she smiled. We both knew that wasn't the point. But I was disarmed by her kindness, and in that state, I resorted to foolishness. Then I felt embarrassed. Luckily, before I could say anything else, Judy's father called her inside. He had been sitting on the porch fixing a carburetor as the birds were bedding down and the last of the late spring light slipped over the house. Judy smiled at me and said goodbye. At nine years old, she was two years younger than me, but her spirit was as old as the earth itself. She was very maternal, and with my own mother far away, I was grateful for her warmth. Usually when I imagine my childhood self, I see him lying in the tall yellow grass or running along the stream through the woods with the simple pleasure of running. I'm more or less a detached observer. But sometimes he suddenly stops whatever he's doing and looks right at me, even though I'm standing in front of the window in December, some 30 years down the road. Why do you keep coming back here? He asks. I think for a moment and I tell him I'm not sure. The sweet kid, his brow furrows and he nods as if to reassure me that not knowing is as good as knowing. I put my arm around him in the half light, and I don't know why, but then we search for answers in the black limbs of the oak trees. Maybe all that is important is that my family and Judy's family shared this moment in the past the same way we shared the trees and the breezes that blew through them. June morning still had a good chill on them, so when I awoke the next day, I quickly pulled on clothes, grabbed the rod, and headed out of the shade, where I was happy to have the June sun warm my back. The rod was sheathed in pine sap, and the real seat fastener was gummed with fish blood. I flushed with excitement when I thought of all the fish the rod had landed, and, I suppose, that had once belonged to a great Micmac fisherman. I considered leaving the rod as it, as it was as a gesture of respect, but I also needed to make the rod mine. So I used some rubbing alcohol and cotton balls to clean it from top to bottom. Then I tied on what I realized now was probably a number 12 leech. I had no idea the fly was a fly, nor that I was in, it was intended to be used with a fly rod. All I knew was that I had a strange hook with a clump of hair tied around it that had magically appeared on the windowsill of an otherwise empty house. My mother had been gone a week, but I could still see the squares of dust from where the boxes had been stacked on the porch. She had actually started packing a couple of years ago, so she would often need things that she had packed. A pan, my sister's curling iron, a certain pair of shoes. She always found what she was looking for, but this went on until she unpacked half the boxes and had to start packing all over again. I placed the alcohol and dirty cotton balls on the porch steps and noted the hole through which the resident skunk entered her den. A couple nights after my mother left for Utah, the skunk sprayed under our porch and the pungent odor covered everything within a 30-foot radius. After that, I wore a hat to bed, slept under three sheets, and put tomorrow's clothes in bread bags. At the time, it was the worst thing. But smelling like a skunk was the only justification I needed to quit school and spend my last days in caribou wandering with the other animals. Incidentally, the one thing worse than a pissed-off skunk is two pissed-off skunks. But we learned to live with them like anything else. Leeches, deep snow, ticks, wet mittens. When Judy gave me the rod, it was as if she had given me the final word of a spell that, when spoken, would temporarily dissolve my troubles and find me angling in the mild June sun. Other than the Aroostook River, which was on the other side of town, and therefore out of the question, Caribou Stream was the best place to fish for trout. As the outer boundary of my childhood stomping grounds, however, I had never gone to the stream alone. But now I was standing with that rod in my hand, the day getting older by the minute, and I had to make a choice. Go or stay put. Most of us get to that point in life where, if we want to do something, we either do alone or sit and wish we had. I reached that point when I was about eight years old. My inner man of caribou has since faded, but I remember it raining in the night and the woods on the way to the trestle were thick with mist and mosquitoes. Somehow it seemed strange to remember a rainstorm that happened over a quarter century ago. A superstitious lot, the folks in Caribou would describe the storms as if they were the natural embodiments of various ill intention. Everything from wicked to confounded to simply ill manner. This was not one of those storms. It dropped a little rain and then left and was exceptional only in the sense that it was my last. And those were my last main mosquitoes, hovering, dipping, and waiting in the cool of the trees. <coughs> I was wrong about some things as a kid. 
But one thing I knew for sure was that everything was hungry in the country. As I neared the trestle, I inspected the rod and line, which was clear and blue as a strand of my grandfather's hair. Though at the time he was not yet dead, I dreamed of fishing with my grandfather's ghost. I kept looking over at him, expecting him to say something, but we fished inwardly and without so much as a word between us. Then the sun went down and I didn't see him anymore. That was the only time he ever visited me in Maine. With our extended family content to remain out west, we were isolated. But isolation inspired us to make do. For me, that meant wandering, which I now did with the oldest purpose. I got down on my hands and knees and then finally my belly and crawled the last ten feet to the trestle. The bank on the other side of the stream was a sunless, moody tangle of vegetation. But a few yards above the trestle, I spotted a small shoal of sand that signaled a feeder stream flowing out of the woods. Far below me, a few trout swayed. When I went for my rod, the rock slipped over the edge and, and the trout scattered. All but one black fish swam on. Then I realized it wasn't a fish at all, but that it was my face floating on the surface. I was a magical thinker as a child, partly because I was a child, and partly because some places have that effect. Magic is not easy to understand, though. I think this is why I like Judy so much. She was magic that could explain herself. I remember standing with her on farm and stream, the small silver thread of water that ran behind our houses. Do you know that when the wind gusts in town, it means the geese are leaving the lakes? I put my hands in my pockets and fiddled with the dirt in the bottom of one of them. Yes, doesn't everybody? When the breezes rose in the trees, the sunlight lit Judy's face and I could see she was unconvinced. Okay, do you know water is my ancestor? I played it safe and said, no, I did not know that. We took off our shoes and soaked our feet in the stream. Then she said that after Micmac women brushed their hair, they would clean their combs and let the strands fall to the earth, where they became rivers. What about streams, I asked her. Same thing, but the hair is children's. Oh, I like that about Judy and her family. They were grounded by their magic, and their stories were like birds, and that no matter how high they flew, they always came back to the earth. I crossed the trestle, stepped off the tracks, and studied the tall grass. The sun revealed a small patch of oat brown mud that I guess led to the water. I held the rod shoulder high and used my other hand to part the grass as I walked through it. Soon I could hear and then see the stream. The water was so clear I put my hand in it to make sure it was really there. Out of the corner of my eye I saw a small dark flutter. A frog was looking at me from its perch atop a stone. I opened the bale and let the line slide across my fingertips as it uncoiled into the water. A few seconds later, I reeled up the scene. The fly swam just beneath the surface, and I enjoyed how well it imitated the fluid wiggle of a leech. Then the water suddenly thickened into a trout that charged out from the bank and seized the fly. The fish's ferocity caught me off guard. I was unprepared for the tugging and thrashing, for the violence of an animal fighting for its life. This was not what I had imagined. I wanted to let go, to be done with it. The trout pulled farther and farther downstream. Perhaps it was because of this distance that I finally mustered the presence of mind to lift the raw tip and finish what I had started. By then, the trout had taken about 15 feet of line, which is considerable on a stream that size. I doubted the trout was still there, but I reeled and reeled and brought the trout to hand. In my excitement, I squeezed the trout so hard his eyes bulged. I turned to tell someone who was not there that I had caught a fish. The sun was burning a white hole through the trees. Emboldened, I told the trout his luck had run out. As I worked the hook from his mouth, he stiffened and silver bubbles rose from deep inside him, and I am almost certain he said that I too would take a turn. Thus the trout was still very much alive, and I needed to get someplace where I could change that. So I backed him and headed for the house. I took the shortcut over two fences, then up Farmham Stream, to the cemetery, where I stood atop the falling stone wall and mapped the way I would take. At that age, there were good reasons not to dilly-dally in the cemetery. The older kids would go out there with beer and candles and hold seances. Other times, they would use the Ouija board, and that would have gone on indefinitely had the doctor's daughter not asked the one question you do not ask and died when the board said she would. I was young, but I remember those stories as well as the roughness of the stones, the drizzles of gnats and the name severed by shadow. I did not dare step on the headstones, lest the unkind dead spoil my dreams. 
Midway through, I came to a grave and startled a cat and her nurse and kittens. I thought maybe they smelled the fish because all they did was hiss and twitch their noses. Covered with matted hair, the mama cat looked awful and I told her so. She watched me until the trout curled like a tongue in my bag. You're hungry, aren't you, girl? I figured this was as good a place as any to clean the trout. I judged the hour and knelt in the damp grass. The earth was soft and my knees soaked the rain and stung until I couldn't feel them. I had not killed with my hands, and part of me couldn't believe I could do what I was about to do. I slipped my buck knife from its sheath and wiped the leaves from the stone, which recorded a single day on earth. I might have brooded on that for a long while had not the largest kitten of the litter stolen my attention by catching a cricket and eating it, song and all. I slid my hand down the trout and eased him from the bag. Although my fingers were pink and clumsy with cold, this time around I tried to be careful, which seems odd considering. Just as I feared the trout had fight left in him. I turned him over and cracked his head lightly on a stone a couple of times, as if I were not quite killing him. It didn't take much, fortunately. By the mama cat's definition, I must have been taking a long time because she looked at me and yawned. Beyond the cemetery, someone tried and tried to start a chainsaw. Porch doors slammed. I slid the knife bent to Gill, just as I had seen my grandfather do on the Snake River. Look there, he would say, lightly pressing on the swim bladder with the tip of his knife. See that? That's the spirit sack. Always empty it. I poked a small hole and the bladder deflated. My eyes watered into my mouth. I didn't mind sipping my eye water, but I had to see, so I wiped my eyes with the tops of my wrists. Then I lifted the bundle of organs and tossed it to the cats. Not quite mean, the kittens acted confused. Mama cat purred and growled as she ate, her green eyes soft and half shut, then crazed and wide and wild. The trout felt light in my hand, like an envelope from which a letter had been taken. When I got to my yard, Ju I saw Judy and her father working in their garden. It was evening and the treetops were noisy with crows. I looked down at my bag and when I looked up again, I saw Judy and her father resting on their tools, watching me. Judy put down her hoe and walked out to meet me. She stood close and looked into the bag. Work trout. Her breath smelled like the pine needle that hung from her mouth. I'll cook it, she offered. As we walked toward her house, I asked her what was worse than being born and dying on the same day. Nothing, she said. I figured you'd say that. Judy's father was already standing at the sink, washing his hands and looking out the window. The room was dark, but a nice fire burned in the potbelly stove. He looked at me and then at Judy. Then he said something in Micmac, and Judy responded and pointed to my back. He nodded, smiled, and held out his hand. He'll cook, she said. I sat at the table in a soft wool blanket, listening to fish, potato, and yellow onion in the pan. I wanted to say thank you, but instead I wrapped my hands around a mug of warm milk, breathed the heat of pine, and tried to let go. I wondered how it would feel to close the door of our house for the last time, and about all the last to follow. Before we left, I would walk to Judy's house and return the rod. It didn't seem right to take it from that place, and I could not imagine needing it where I was going, because I could not imagine where I was going. After that, I would take my last ride down Sweden Street and over the Aroostook River and its silent boiling, then on up the hill and out of town without once thinking to look back. I can't remember my father's last words before we boarded the plane that would take carry us west, but I know he said them and it was not easy. Judy stoked the fire as I finished up the trout. Light from the stove flickered across the bone comb on my plate and a black and white photograph of Judy's great grandmother. I could see night building and decided I would not move until I saw my father's headlights or the light go on in my brother's room. As I sat in that chair, one by one, my favorite haunts came and went. I said goodbye to the lakes and to the woods and, of course, the caribou stream. Then I thought about our land outside of town and how I would miss it. Each fall, my father, brother, and I would rise before the sun and travel an hour north and spend two days clearing some 20 acres of grass and brush with a sweeping wall of fire. My father set and spread the fire while my brother and I made a game of running and leaping through the flames. Sometimes the wind picked up and on it I could smell the coming snow. The newly fed fire would rise until I could not see my father and brother. Just as suddenly they would reappear behind the flames 
and the hot ash would swirl and swirl around them like disintegrating stars. When the burning was done, we would walk across that monotony of ash toward our camp in the white birch trees. There, my father would smoke his pipe and look ahead to next year's burning. The last time we burned, though, he didn't talk about next year or any year after that. But the years were still there, white, <clears throat> unspoken, underground, a mesh of moist, white roots searching, widening, and rising toward the charred mice that could not reach their holes. And thus the knowledge that things can be and still not be, and that if I do not get right with the places I leave, they will always feel like fires from which I cannot run fast enough. Thank you.